May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, since I won't be able to be with my own family this Thanksgiving, I had the opportunity this week to go and visit my mother, who lives in Florida. And the other day, we had dinner in a town called St. Augustine, which is not too far from where she lives. It's a beautiful city if you've never been to St. Augustine. Here's a fun fact. It's actually the oldest continuously inhabited European settlement in the United States. It was founded by the Spanish in 1565. It was a military outpost that became a center for Spanish plantations in this part of what they called the New World. We've heard a lot recently about the year 1619, as more and more Americans became aware of this as the date when a small group of British settlers and slaves landed in Jamestown, thus marking the beginning of slavery in the United States. But really, if you want to get technical, slavery in the territory of the United States started not with the British, but with the Spanish in what would become the state of Florida in and around St. Augustine. This all happened some 50 years before the British even made it to Jamestown. Well, all this is just to say in another way that when I was in St. Augustine this week, I was walking on land that had been a site of continuous human enslavement longer than anywhere else in our country. I knew you're supposed to go to Florida, enjoy the beach and the palm trees and everything, but that's actually what I was thinking about in my weird little brain. And all this is just a little bit of background for what I experienced this week when I was there. So when you go to St. Augustine, and if you're driving in from the coast, you pass a lovely tree-lined central square that used to be the Spanish Plaza. There's a church on the square called Trinity Episcopal Church. Another fun fact, it's the oldest Protestant church in the state of Florida. So to get to the square, you cross over what's called the Bridge of Lions, beautiful bridge, and you're greeted by a large flagpole. Now, the day that we were there, it was really windy, and so it happened that the American flag at the top of the pole got all tangled up. For whatever reason, the fire department was called in to untangle it, and the firemen used their crane coming off the fire truck to go up there and take care of it. My mom and I joined a crowd of people that were gathered to watch this whole thing happen because it was actually pretty interesting and amusing. And as soon as the flag was freed, the crowd cheered and applauded, which felt fun. But almost immediately, part of the crowd started chanting, F. Biden. F. Biden. It was obviously uncomfortable, so we hurried off to dinner. As the hostess led us through the extensive dining room, because it was a big restaurant, I noticed that every single one of the patrons was white. No sooner had we been seated than I overheard the conversation at the table behind me, people who were talking about the news of the day. All four of the people were talking about how happy and excited they were that Kyle Rittenhouse had been acquitted. I was disturbed, so I tried to tune them out. But that just made me tune in to the table next to them, which was talking about exactly the same thing. At least the salad was tasty. This is America in 2021. Now, I know everything I said is anecdotal, and maybe I just happened to pass through lovely St. Augustine, Florida on a weird day. And I imagine there's some preacher in the Sunshine State this morning who is telling their congregation about their terrible trip to New York City where everyone was so rude and awful. But let's just acknowledge for a moment that even in the relative calm that we presently enjoy in our national life, My goodness, there is still a strong and deep undercurrent of profound sickness. 
a group of strangers spontaneously chanting obscenities about the current president as if he was responsible for the wind that day in Florida? People over dinner saying happy things about a violent act in which two people were killed by a teenager with an assault rifle at a political protest? There is a menacing hatred that grips people who are often otherwise reasonable and kind. And it makes them long for power to be used for the oppression of their fellow citizens. Now, yes, there is vitriol across the spectrum of American political life. But the incidents I witnessed this week were evidence of something particularly disturbing about how people have come to relate to power in our time. And this is the desire to use power to make other people feel unwelcome and afraid, even to the point of fearing for their own lives. Simply put, let us remember that today's America has a sick relationship with power. Where can we possibly find the medicine for this illness? Today is called Christ the King Sunday. Today we acknowledge that our Lord was nothing more than a poor and disenfranchised Jewish peasant. We bow to him as our sovereign and king, even though the only crown he ever wore was made of thorns. We marvel that we used his authority and power to lift up the downcast, to heal the brokenness of the world, and to spread the message of love for God and for all people. This is part of what it means to be a Christian. We accept the contradiction of Jesus, the King of Kings, who rode a donkey into Jerusalem, the Lord of Lords who was executed as a common criminal. When we say that his is the kingdom and the power and the glory, we proclaim that all of our earthly notions of what those things mean are an illusion, a childish fantasy. Jesus teaches us that true power is humility and that his reign is based on love and love alone. Jesus teaches us that the purpose of having power is not to hoard it, but to give it away so that all people may feel empowered. Now think for a moment about how radical that idea is. The purpose of having power is to empower other people. Now deep down, we all know that that's true. Parents have immense power over their children. But any good parent wants to raise an independent and empowered child. Authority figures like teachers, nurses, doctors, caregivers, they use their power to educate, to heal, and to build up other people. Jesus shows us that every single form of power can be used to build up his kingdom of love and radical acceptance for all people. What's more, he teaches us by example that it's not just the people with the titles and offices that are powerful, but that each and every one of us has the power to do this work. That's what real authority looks like. And when we set our hearts on that kind of power, God will always be on our side. The disordered relationship to power that is shaping our national life at the moment, let me just say it, is profoundly anti-Christian. That's not a political statement, and it's not even meant to be provocative. It's just something that should be plain to anyone who has read the Bible. When Jesus stood before Pilate, he knew that he was the Son of God, come to be the Messiah to the entire world. And yet when Pilate gave him the opportunity to justify himself, he simply threw the question right back at Pilate. Jesus didn't stand there and whip up the crowds for 
his own sake or to save himself. Instead, he laid himself down so that his sacrifice might be made an example to all people for all time. <clears throat> With all things, Jesus has the power to heal. And I believe <clears throat> he can even heal the sickness of our own time when it comes to our relationship with power. All we have to do is have faith in him as our king and lord and follow his example. Whenever we use our power the way that he used his, we are joining with him to heal this broken world and to realign its relationship with power. And every year at All Saints, we have an abundance campaign in which we examine our relationship with our money. And I think this is an extremely important spiritual exercise for us to do as individuals and as a faith community. <clears throat> but as we all know, money and power are very close friends and allies. So perhaps today we should take a moment to examine our own relationship with power. In my experience, most people underestimate the amount of power that they have. You may not have any idea of how powerful you are. You may have lost sight of the authority that you have in your family, at your school, among your friends and acquaintances, or at your job. You may have become cynical about the power that you have as a citizen in the political and civic life of our community and our nation. And you might even be totally unaware of this moral and spiritual authority that you have in this church and in the world. It's amazing how people so often remember lessons from Sunday school or something someone said in church years or decades later. The things that we do and say in this place are incredibly powerful. We underestimate the power we have because having power is scary. It means you have responsibility and that ultimately you are accountable for your words and actions. And most of us don't want that. But to truly follow Jesus, you have to be honest about your power and then use it the way that he did. So on this Christ the King Sunday, take a moment to take stock of the power that you have. Don't be shy. Each and every one of us has power of some kind. And then ask yourself, do I use my power and my family and friend group to lift up the people in my life to the best of my ability? Am I using my professional position to heal this broken world? Do I take seriously my role as a member of the community to advocate for the things that I know are right? Am I even aware of the spiritual authority that I have among the people that I know? Do I, like Jesus, take the power I have and give it away? freely, so that everyone may feel the authority over their own lives given to them by God? As I look out, I know that this is a congregation of powerful people. And if you're anything like me, the answers to these questions are probably a little bit of a mixed bag. But each time we use our power to remind the world that we are all God's beloved children, then we push back the forces that would use power to tear others down. And when we do this, we follow right directly in Jesus' footsteps. So, my friends, Christ is our King. He is our Lord. He is our power and our authority. And he uses that power so that each and every one of us sitting in this church today may know that we, too, are powerful 
simply by virtue of the fact that we are his. Let us use that power wisely. Let us push back the dark forces that we encounter day to day. And let us exercise our power in the full faith and knowledge that when we follow in Jesus' footsteps, God will always be by our side. Amen.